L'histoire du samouraï, le thème du samouraï, c'est le thème de la solitude. On pourrait résumer le, le film en une phrase qui est extraite du livre sacré des samouraïs, le Bushido, qui dit ceci, « Il n'est pas de plus profonde solitude que celle du samouraï, si ce n'est celle du tigre dans sa jungle, peut-être. » C'est très beau, cette phrase. Je crois, oui. This opening line is attributed to the Book of Bushido. It's a belief that underpins the entirety of the samurai from beginning to end. It's also a complete lie. For one, there is no Book of Bushido. There is a book called Bushido, The Soul of Japan, written by Nazo Natobi in 1899, which studied the lifestyle and beliefs of the samurai. Bushido was the moral code followed by all samurai established in the Edo period. The quote itself was written by Jean-Pierre Melville, the film's director. Even Melville was surprised when the Japanese cut of the film maintained the quote in its entirety, untampered. This elusive tenet that we're shown in the opening scene tells us everything we need to know about Melville. He was a filmmaker who meticulously crafted a fantasy, one that we're more than happy to accept as truth. In 1965, Melville met with actor Elaine Delon at his home to pitch a story and try and get him on board the upcoming crime thriller. He had only been outlining the story for 10 minutes when the actor interrupted him. The story has no dialogue so far. I will do it. Shortly after, Delon showed him his bedroom, simple, with almost no furnishings but for one, a katana. The samurai follows the stoic hitman Jeff Costello. After carrying out a hit on the owner of a jazz club, he becomes embroiled in a struggle to evade both the law and the gangsters who hired him. The plot is simple and nothing you haven't heard before, but the magic lies in the character and how he moves through the world he inhabits. Jeff Costello abides by the strict code of the samurai. He prefers to remain detached, but his conscience only serves to place him in more danger. We first meet the character lying on an undressed mattress in his apartment, which says more about him than any monologue could. The room is sparse with peeling wallpaper, but his clothes are immaculate. His only company is a caged bird. His movements are clean and methodical, from the way he raises the collar on his coat to the razor-sharp glide of his fingers across the brim of his hat. This is a man of very specific standards and little indulgence. His lifestyle translates effortlessly into his approach to his profession. His outfit was very intentional. While at first glance he appears the same as any common man walking the streets of Paris in the 60s, Melville treats his attire as a uniform. He said, I think the virile hero needs a horse, boots and a saddle. As you've probably noticed, they're not exactly common on the streets of Paris. But at least you can give him a hat, a raincoat with a belt and collar that can be turned up, and a button to do up when it rains. It's a man's get-up, an echo both of the western and military uniform. This is Jeff's armor. He is a warrior, and he becomes an icon out of his time, the last emblem of honor in a world without compromise. The samurai came towards the end of the French New Wave movement. The films of this period often reflected their genre in their characters, but Melville established very quickly that this rule would be broken. While the film is within the crime genre, Jeff is so much more than a simple criminal. The character appeals to the audience due to a combination of two core traits, discipline and humanity. The discipline is very apparent from the first moments of the film, but it's this raw, unfiltered emotion that pours through his eyes that causes everyone who meets him to bend to his will. From a professional standpoint, things go wrong for Jeff very quickly. Three eyewitnesses can place him at the scene of the crime, and despite his preparations to remain indistinguishable, he's picked up on a routine police check shortly after the murder. Upon inspection during a lineup, the commissaire immediately suspects him. However, given he stands in front of all three eyewitnesses wearing almost identical attire to the scene of the crime, it's some miracle that none of them can say for sure whether it's him. The bartender doesn't give him away as he's working with the mob, who want to dispose of him in their own manner before the police can get any information out of him. But by maintaining a sense of complete calm in the most dire of situations, he fools this lady entirely. Though one girl does in fact recognize him, the pianist, played by Kathy Rosier, though she refuses to give him up. Later on, when asked why, she refuses to answer, and we are never directly told, but it becomes clear that she is entranced by him. His lover, Jane Lagrange, doesn't betray him even under severe scrutiny and threat to her freedom from the police. Costello can't offer her a true relationship and devoted love, yet she would rather go down for him than betray him, even if it meant never seeing him again. Delon is alluring in this role, with a quality that can't quite be defined. Despite the picture painted by his lifestyle, he is a man who needs love, and he's incredibly dependent on Lagrange, both emotionally and in terms of his profession. The silent, stoic archetype usually tends to depict a hero in need of love, but always in denial of that fact. They bear 
bury their emotional needs under the tough guy bravado, but Jeff is well aware of his needs and he accepts it without any care as to how it will affect his masculinity. When asked about Jeff, Melville says that man carries his own death with him always and there is a sense of doom to Delon's character that is prevalent whenever he's on screen. While the opening quote from the Bushido is a fabrication, Roger Ebert once drew a comparison between Jeff and a real quote from Bushido that certainly pertains to the character. One who is a samurai must before all things keep constantly in mind by day and by night the fact that he has to die. That is his chief business. Melville has gone further with the concept. He explained that Kathy Rosier's character is the embodiment of death, returning to the question of why she never gave him up at the police station. We only need to look at Melville's own words to truly understand why. He explains that when their eyes meet, she is unafraid. In that moment, Jeff has the hypnotic power of the serpent, which just stares at its prey until it can no longer move. Sure of his power, he prevents her from crying out just by looking at her. He dominates death because he is not yet subject to her. But as the film goes on, he starts to fall in love with his own death. She holds a charm that fascinates him and captivates. In the end, he realizes the only way to save those who are loyal to him is to embrace her. Even the commissaire, whose goal is to capture Jeff and bring him to justice, has a certain obsession with him, as though he too has been seduced. Despite Jeff's watertight alibi, he is convinced of his guilt. Melville explained that while the pianist is death, the commissaire is destiny. This is why Jeff never shows hostility towards him. He grows to understand that destiny is simply a part of life and he won't fight it. Jeff's hypnotic charm is what gets him out of trouble but also what ultimately seals his fate. It's this magic that draws people to him, but it's also why the commissaire knows that he is the culprit of this crime. Nevertheless, if the samurai is going to die, it will be on his own terms. This is where the discipline and humanity converge and what makes him so different to the average criminal. It's through his relationships that he thrives, but also how he dies. Take this scene for example, where police officers under no jurisdiction of the law sneak into the building and wiretap his apartment, hoping to yield some confession from Jeff while he's unaware. Their methodical, silent approach mirrors that of Jeff's own. In one sense, law enforcement is almost identical to the criminals they hunt. Despite the officer's extensive, painstaking efforts to leave no trace, Jeff knows something is off as soon as he re-enters his apartment. How does he know? Because of his bullfinch. Familiar with her songs and vocal patterns, he knows the bird has been perturbed by something, which causes him to search for the source of this disturbance. Jeff speaks a language without making a noise, but it can only be understood by those he truly cares for. In the final scene of the film, we see Jeff return to the jazz club. After rectifying his conflict with the mob, they task him with killing the only remaining eyewitness, the pianist. He is no longer the loose end in this conspiracy, she is, but instead of carrying out the hit, he frames himself, firing the gun at her with an empty barrel and assuring her innocence while allowing himself to be shot down. This final act ensures the safety of those who he loves. It's an act of harakiri, as Melville calls it. Upon returning to the jazz club, Jeff orders a whiskey while he waits. The bartender, well aware of who he is, makes a jest about the killer always returning to the scene of the crime. Jeff doesn't like that, so he leaves, and he pays for his whiskey, even though he hasn't been served the drink yet. But it's already been ordered, he has rules and honour, and he will abide by them in every facet of his life, from the smallest to the largest of interactions. Jeff Costello is a character that has been adapted many times throughout the years, and many of his on-screen descendants resonate with audiences today. Online fandoms have developed a running joke of, he's literally me, around characters from films that were significantly influenced by Elaine Delon's. Knowing that makes it all the more fascinating that Jeff Costello was written as a schizophrenic. Melville himself has spoken at length about the in-depth research he did on schizophrenia when crafting the character of Jeff Costello. He ascribes his clinical, meticulous methods and lifestyle to his mental health condition. He also claimed that because of this, Jeff sees himself as an innocent in many ways. He's not aware of his nature as a criminal. This is not to say that anyone who is schizophrenic has no sense of right and wrong. The condition manifests itself in many different ways and is dependent on the individual. But the silence, the introversion, the life of solitude and scrupulous approach to his tasks, all of this, Melville claims, was the result of his schizophrenia. I desire only one thing in life to be left alone. This quote, more than any other, sums up Melville's character the best. The character and story of Jeff is reflected in Melville. He was known as somewhat of a lone wolf among his peers. He was refused a union card from the French Technicians Group, which would be our modern day equivalent of a director's guild. So he decided to build his own studio. That way he didn't have to take orders from anyone. He enjoyed the freedom attained by shooting with a small crew. He once said, While I was shooting the tailing sequences in the Metro for La Samurai, I remember inwardly cursing at the person who'd written the script without considering the difficulties involved in shooting the scene. And then I remembered I'd written it myself. He was known to be charming, but at times was referred to as a tyrant on set. Melville's refuge was his desk, where he wrote scripts and edited in the middle of the night, with his sunglasses on and all the windows and shutters closed. 
He believed art was only possible when the creator is alone, when he isolates himself from the rest of the world. Known as one of the godfathers of the French New Wave movement, he quickly fell out of love with the films that followed him. He hated cliques and industry politics, and while many of his contemporaries took political stances, such as Jean-Luc Godard or Francois Truffaut, Melville had no desire to be outspoken on political issues. I shun the world of the present, which I never managed to love. He was a proponent of individualism and enjoyed its portrayal in American gangster films and westerns. Melville took great influence from American cinema, unlike many of his peers, and although he did love many films from the West, he hated to be dubbed as an American filmmaker. I have been tidied away once and for all in a drawer, under the label American. This is quite wrong. I'm absolutely not an American director. If by this people mean I make films with enormous care leaving nothing to chance, my answer is that the great Japanese directors work the same way. Anyways, I feel much more Japanese than American. The Samurai is a Japanese film, as the title suggests. Melville was outspoken in his love for American gangster films. Interestingly, when the film debuted in the US, it was under the title The Godson due to the recent success of The Godfather. But Jeff Costello is nothing like the traditional gangster or criminal. He's a different animal entirely. I'm quite happy to have you say I make gangster films inspired by the gangster novels, but I do not make American films, even though I like American film noirs better than anything. He received nearly 60 offers for American films, but rejected all of them, mainly due to the contract clauses. I don't know if you've ever read an American contract, but it's terrifying. Take this clause for instance. You hereby undertake that during the making and distribution of the film, you will at no time conduct yourself publicly or privately in any manner which offends against decency or morality, or causes you to be held in public ridicule, scorn or contempt, or causes public scandal, or which would be prejudicial to the film, theatre or television or radio industries in general. In the case of such conduct, the company may, prior to the completion of the work contracted, terminate the contract without any further obligation of any kind. It isn't possible to work under such conditions. Suppose I sign a contract like that and start shooting, and for some reason or other the star decides he isn't satisfied with my work. So the company looks into my past and discovers that I was once a homosexual or a thief or a member of the Communist Party, and they can kick me out just like that. Now obviously, some of those examples are not a point of controversy in today's industry, but the overall issue he's discussing is something that many working creatives can resonate with. As you can see, it's evident that Melville struggled to fit in anywhere. Much like Costello, he's not quite as bad as other criminals, but not quite as moral as the average citizen. He lived in his movie studio with his wife and three cats, and the studio burned down during the making of Le Samurai. On June 29th, 1967, the converted factory caught fire in the middle of the night. His bedroom had heavily lined curtains and close-fitting shutters, keeping him in complete darkness, with a sleeping mask that muffled out all other sounds. Even when it came to the design of his bedroom, Melville was meticulous and obsessive, and it almost got him killed. It was his Siamese cat that woke him. He then rushed through the old factory, watching his life's work burn to ashes around him. When he realized he had left his cat behind, he re-entered the studio, now completely ablaze. He climbed to the second floor apartment, grabbed his cat in one hand and a signed picture of the famous French army officer General de Gaulle in the other before returning to safety. Nine fire brigades and two hours later the fire burnt out. Melville was a self-professed paranoiac and it really shows in the interview he did on television the following morning. He spoke of the suspicious nature of the fire. He noted many strange occurrences related to the studio in the preceding six weeks. He was one of the only studios in production at the time due to the ongoing production conflicts in the French film industry. He spoke of unannounced inspections, strange people showing up during production and pressuring his producers to shut down filming, and many other trivial annoyances which were perhaps not at all coincidental. Melville had been marked as an outsider, shooting without permits or a union card on his own terms, and the industry did not like this. While it can't be said for certain that someone intentionally burned down his studio, the life he experienced while shooting began to blend with that of Jeff Costello's in the film. An outsider on the fringe of society, whose unique code and way of life provoked antagonism from all sides. Costello may well have escaped his fate in the film had he simply left Paris, but he felt indebted to his lover, one who was now at risk for protecting him, and he plunged himself back into the thick of it to set things right for those who had been affected by him. Melville, ever the romanticist, could not bear to let his cat burn down with the studio. After it was the reason he was still alive. Much like Costello, Melville had an affection for his animal companion, who was responsible for saving him, and so plunged himself back into the thick of the fire. The cat would go on to feature in his next film, Le Circle Rouge, though sadly, the bullfinch featured in Le Samurai burned down along with the studio. The mirroring of reality in Le Samurai extends far beyond Melville. The mechanic who fits Jeff's number plate in the opening sequence, Andre Salgis, was an old friend of Melville's who worked with him on a previous film. Yes, he was an old friend, although he was very ill and agreed to do this small part in The Samurai to please me. After the shooting was finished, he just had time to dub himself before going to the hospital to die. 
When he says, Je te préviens, Jeff. C'est la dernière fois. I knew he was dying. Elaine Delon learned of his death the day he came in to record his reply to this line, and his D'accord. is spoken like a farewell. Elaine himself was married to his on-screen lover, Natalie Delon. Though a little disturbing, Melville's main motivation for casting her alongside him was that he thought they looked like brother and sister. Jane Lagrange was the woman upon whom Costello could depend, the only being other than his bullfinch that he truly trusted. Natalie and Elaine were divorced shortly after the shooting of the film. Melville was unaware of this when he shot their final scene together, but in the years after, he said, Every time I look at that scene now, I get the impression that they're saying goodbye for real. In fact, it was that same evening that they finally separated. The samurai has given birth to a long dynasty of reimaginings and spiritual successes. Though technically part of a trilogy of anthology films featuring Delon, it has stood the test of time best. This is in large part due to Melville's vision. He was known for his lack of decoration in his sets. He claimed, I don't want to situate my heroes in time. I don't want the action of a film to be recognizable as something that happens in 1968. That's why in The Samurai, for example, the women aren't wearing miniskirts while the men are wearing hats, something, unfortunately, that no one does anymore. I'm not interested in realism. All my films hinge on the fantastic. I'm not a documentarian. A film is first and foremost a dream, and it's absurd to copy life in an attempt to produce an exact recreation of it. Transposition is more or less a reflex with me. I move from realism to fantasy without the spectator ever noticing. Upon first watching The Samurai, I nearly had a complete crisis of identity. Not because the film was mind-blowing and revolutionary or made me reevaluate the way I see the world. I had this crisis because I was so, so bored. I, like many others, aspire to be a creative and a filmmaker. And yet I can barely force myself to sit down and watch some of the defining films in cinematic history. My generation has grown up in a world where the film industry has readapted and retold the same types of stories over and over again, only much faster and punchier, never allowing the viewer to grow idle. So by the time we arrive at a film like The Samurai or The Godfather or Bullet, we've seen the movie a dozen different times in a dozen different ways. And although none of them are necessarily better, we have already seen them, and we've seen them in half the runtime. What I didn't understand was that all of this slow pacing was intentional. Perhaps not for all classic films, but certainly in the case of Le Samurai. It's a movie that wants to let you sit in it, to stew in the minutia and the unimportant details that you would never dare allow if you were going by today's standards of filmmaking. If you enrolled in film school tomorrow, one of the first lessons you'd be taught is that you have 10 minutes to win over your audience. It doesn't matter if the remaining 100 minutes are a little dull. If you've got them within the first 10, you'll more than likely have them for the rest of it. The first 7 minutes of The Samurai don't contain a single spoken word. And by the time we hit the 10 minute mark, we've watched Jeff smoke a cigarette, adorn his coat and hat, steal a car by painstakingly trying a large assortment of keys, light another cigarette, watch a mechanic carry out every step of the process to refit a number plate, then drive to another building, where we see him park, walk through several sets of doors, and buzz into another apartment. It seems as though almost nothing has been achieved within the 10 minutes, but everything has been achieved. It sets the tone for the entire film, where we'll watch simple processes carried out with attentive detail. The police lineup was where I first started to waver. From minute 22, we watch the commissaire carry out his investigation, going back and forth from room to room, questioning suspects and checking alibis, and it's not until minute 39 that Jeff walks free. 17 minutes of the film covered a process that in actuality could have been shown in less than 5. After a gunshot, a film may show a scene where the hero finishes the stitches. They may even get stabbed through the heart and wake up one scene later. But when Jeff Costello gets a light graze from a bullet, you will watch him clean and fully dress the wound. You'll watch him put the first aid kit back in its allotted cupboard and ensure his bird has been fed before proceeding with the story. And you can be sure that we'll go back to him redressing the wound again later in the film. The timing, the patience required to be this man. It can be maddening upon first viewing. But in time, I began to understand the story is secondary. Everything you need to know will eventually come provided you sit in the mood and follow this character through each step of his mission. Perhaps this is maddening, but to a man of discipline, it's expected and it's easily endured. Je ne parle jamais à un homme qui tient une arme dans la main. C'est une règle. Une habitude. 
This film is the blueprint for a large number of iconic movies today. Melville was considered one of the godfathers of French New Wave during his career, and today he can also be considered the godfather to modern day neo-noir crime thrillers. Michael Mann's Thief, Scorsese's Taxi Driver, John Woo's The Killer, Walter Hill's The Driver, Nick Reffin's Drive, even David Fincher's latest film The Killer, these are all films with characters that very evidently draw inspiration from Jeff Costello, but a huge amount of pop culture today is in some part directly inspired by this one movie. Blade Runner, The Way of the Samurai, No Country for Old Men, Reservoir Dogs, Collateral, John Wick, Nightcrawler, and even The Mandalorian are just a few of the notable names that have drawn heavily from Jean-Pierre Melville. Many attributed Reffin's influences on Drive to Walter Hill's The Driver, but when asked about this, Walter Hill spoke of his friendship with Reffin and how film producer Billy Friedkin introduced the two at Walter's home. Upon meeting each other, Reffin almost immediately said, We both know we've stolen from Jean-Pierre Melville. America has an obsession with the samurai. No matter how filtered or bastardized that depiction becomes, the roots all stem back to an outcast who lives by rules that set him apart from the rest of his kind, often carrying a sense of doom. Melville understood this and crafted such an incredibly simple yet intricate character from which so many more have spawned. Jeff Costello is the distilled essence of cinema's solitary guns for hire, and he has echoed throughout film ever since his conception. It's more than likely that Jean-Pierre Melville has had considerable influence on some of your favorite characters of all time. You just didn't know it. But if Melville had slept through the night while his studio burned around him, the samurai would never have been released. So there is someone else who may deserve some of the credit.